Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Al Jones. He has many stories to his life. He is a service-disabled veteran. He turned a poor financial situation of identity theft around, and he's created user-friendly games for puzzle books, mobile devices, live shows, playing cards, and more. And like that's even just like the start of it. So I'm excited to hear from Al today and learn more about him and his life. So thank you so much for being here, Al. Why don't you go ahead and tell us more about you? Thanks for having me, Sarah. It is truly a pleasure being invited to your show. And as you touched on, after years of making poor financial decisions and thinking it was the norm, I decided to take action, make a change in my life, document the process along the way. So what I'm here now is wanting to share my story with your guests about going from having poor credit to achieving the perfect 850 credit score. Great. So you said there, you know, you thought the decisions you were making were the norm. Can you share a little bit about what your life was like before you started to turn things around financially? We'll go back to my early childhood. Uh, my mother and father, they divorced early in my childhood, around third, fourth grade, roughly, as I recall. And what was happening was after mom and dad split, finances really took a turn for the worst. And what was happening was my mother started working multiple jobs. I think she was depressed because of the whole divorce thing. You've got a, a single mom with three kids you know, that you've got to support. So what she was doing, she was sad and kind of depressed per se about the whole situation of having to raise three kids. And her financial, personal financial management was lacking at best. And what was happening was she would take from what I saw as a child, from the child's point of view, she was taking a lot of her incoming funds and just buying purses, hats, dresses, shoes, that kind of stuff. And bills would just start piling up. So in working the multiple jobs, my sister was out doing her thing. My younger brother was out kind of doing his thing. So someone had to take care of the house, per se and field all the incoming calls. So calls started to, I recall calls started to come in at just the craziest hours of the night. And back in the 70s, let's say mid 70s or so, around that time, the bill collectors, the requirements on what they could and could not do, that seemed to have been out the window. They'll call you at 8.30, 9, 9.30 at night. You know, of course, most of the family is out and about doing their thing that I'm at home alone as a child. And I'm picking up the phone. And these bill collectors would call and they were not the most nicest people in the world. So they pick up the phone. Hi, this is this is Al. Uh, how can I, you know, something like, you know, how can I help you kind of thing? So you know, where's your mom? You know, I would get a little, obviously a little bit nervous or so. Where's your mom? She owes us X amount of dollars. She needs to pay, you know, X amount by, you know, a certain date. And I would get scared, obviously. And back then, before the current voicemails and stuff, we had this little note, a notepad where we would actually write down, like a memo pad, we would actually write down who called, and share the messages, message information with whomever. So I would take little notes about who called, you know, Mr. Smith called on a certain day and whatnot, and they would continue to scream at me. And I said, Mr. You know, Mr. Smith, I, I promise, I promise, I promise, I'll, I'll let her know. Well, you better tell your mom that she needs to call us and make this payment. You know, yes, sir. And they just hang up the phone. So after that was over, I obviously would write down the notes, Mom would come in from, you know, doing work and whatnot uh, late at night. I'd hand her these little notes about all these people calling. 
She'd look at it. Sometimes she would discount. It's like, yeah, 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 I'll call them later or whatever. Think, Mom, you really, really need. Yeah, Al, I got you. I'll call them. Okay. So after years, I'll say about a year or, or more or so, of doing that on a repeated basis, I got really good at talking to, and I'm a little kid, let's say preteen or so, I got really good with talking to the bill collectors on the phone, and I was articulate enough, I was responsive, responsible enough in dealing with these bill collectors. It got to the point to where I start negotiating payment terms with these bill collectors that were screaming, bye bye were the days of them screaming at me. And you know, I pick up the phone, it's like, hi, this is, out. I had a little script, I had a little script, it's like, hi, and if I figured, okay, you know, Mr. Smith is typically calls on Thursday at eight. All right, here's a little script for Mr. Smith. So, brrr, you know, phone rings, I pick up the phone. Hello, it's, uh, you know, mentioned mom's name. It's like, well, she's not here right right now, sir. Talking like an adult, per se, as, you know, as a little kid. Well, she's not here right now. And I just thought I'd let you know, I did relay your message to my mother and she is more than willing to pay for, you know, your whatever at this time. Well, for example, well, she needs to pay us $500. Well, she doesn't have $500 at this time, you know, Mr. Smith, but she is willing to pay, we'll say 400. You think you could do 400? And there's a pause, like, okay, I'm negotiating with the little kid. So he said, well, you know, okay, we'll take 400. Okay, so you will take 400 for this bill, this account number, and this is how she can pay you, and then when she needs to pay. Yeah. Okay, I, I I will talk to her when she gets home and we'll make it happen, Mr. Smith. All right, thank you. Click. And I just started getting really good, you know, at negotiating. So fast forward, getting, getting through all that, help mom out with her finances as a, as a kid, trying to get her on the right track. Fast forward. And in growing up, I thought that that was the norm. Okay, well, you just, everybody lives in hard times. You watch TV shows like Good Times and whatnot, and you're thinking, okay, Everybody lives in hard times and nobody's really supposed to have money you know, except they're super rich, you know, kind of stuff. So um, I thought that that was just how life was supposed to be. As long as you got a blank check, say, just float it a bit and suddenly you've got money in the bank. Well, that doesn't always work. <laughs> that doesn't always work. So I leave home, college, and I get the student loans and the student loans, you just kind of do whatever, you know, with the, <laughs> with the student loans. And kind of question, well, should I pay it back and whatnot? And obviously, I did pay off my student loans. And I had the mindset of, well, okay, and mom did it, and everybody else seems to do it. Hey, as long as I got a check, I got money in the bank to float it. That starts catching up with you. That starts catching up with you. And obviously, it caught up with me. And I was going through the same cycle, just blowing money. You know, what little money I did have, just kind of blowing money. Well, I'll take my friends, I get a, a credit card, for example, issued out to you. You go to college, and back then, when you're signing up for classes, oftentimes you've got the bill, I mean, the uh, credit card companies, they'll have these banquet tables nearby where you're filling out stuff for class, registering for class. And well, if you sign up for this credit card, you'll get, you know, a free t shirt or free, you know, pizza for for a month you're thinking wow oh yeah sure yeah okay sign here and they see you know you got this credit card you're looking at the, the line of credit oh my lord 2500 bucks holy smoke i've never seen you know 2500 bucks so you just start blowing it me you said oh yeah take your friends out for lunch let's go have pizza hey, it's on me big time so last the you know, next thing you know you you got a bill it's like oh really Minimum balance. Well, okay, I, I, I guess I can pay the minimum balance, <laughs> and that just keeps going and going and going and, and catching up with you. So finally, you get older, and it just caught up with me, Sarah. It just caught up with me. I got tired of just living hand to mouth. Tired of going into places wanting to purchase items on credit, for example. And merchants will just kind of the you know, sales reps will just kind of look at you like, <laughs> yeah. I just ran your credit there, Al, and uh, I don't think that's going to happen for a while. 
oh, wow, maybe it's just, it's just meant to be. I'm supposed to have bad credit and not have things in life. So again, fast forward. I said, all right, this is just insane, Al. This is insane. You need to make a decision and just, you know, make a change in your life. This is, this is bull, this is bull crap. This is, bull, this is just crap. This is crazy. So what I did is like, okay, I'm just tired of living in squalor, you know? So I said, okay, how am I going to do this? Let me, let me find some books, go to the local library. So did the, did the whole library thing. And many of the books, and even to, the, even to this day, many of the books, the personal finance books on how do you improve your life and how do you improve your credit, most of those books are filled with bluff. Okay, if you read this 200-page book, you'll learn how to improve your credit. Now, typically after the first, the first chapter, you look at it and you start reading like, oh, I got 10 more chapters to go. I don't know. No, no, this is not going to work for me. So then you think, wow, okay, let me just, I, you get a little frustrated for a while, a couple of months or so. Then you try at it again. You purchase a, a CD set. Somebody new comes along. Well, if you listen to this eight pack CD about how to manage your credit, then yeah, sure, your life will turn around, you know, in a blink of an eye. So did this, fell into that, bought this, you know, the CD set this before. And the whole DV thing started kicking up, but did the whole CD set. First CD, you know, was typically about a, a chapter or so in the printed version link. And did this first CD, it's like, oh, you know, seven more discs to go. And uh, I, I just, just not for me, you know, I'm destined to just be, uh, you know, just to have bad credit. So did that. And then finally, I said, you know what? Let me do start documenting the process of what I had to do to improve my credit, started making notes, started ordering my credit reports and scores from each of the three separate, notice the catch words, each of the three separate credit bureaus, ordered them from each of those, saw those, and just started cleaning them up, negotiating this. I didn't file for bankruptcy. I didn't go to a credit repair service where you pay X amount of dollars and things happen. <laughs> so I didn't do that. Mine was working multiple jobs and making huge sacrifices. And over about say 15 or so years after cleaning this, you know, things up and making negotiations here and there with the lending uh, institutions, I was able to achieve 850. So here I be. And it's great to kind of see that you you know, tried different things, you tried to learn, you know, but having the foundation that you had from childhood, it was kind of like, you know, this is just, it's just what it is. Um, so then to have taken that time and know that like, it's not going to get better in a day, like you're, you're really going to have to work on it. So what was it like then for you when it, things started to get better with your credit score, what did that start to feel like? When I had, when I first recalls checking it, it was like uh, you know, 600, low 600 or so. And what I did is I created goals. Initially, it's like, okay, 850, really? That's when, you know, that was just so far out of my scope. You, know, you see it, it's like 850. Who gets a you know credit score of 850? You see others missing, you know, getting the 850, blah, blah, blah. But you I never saw anyone online at that time that actually had it. So first it was okay, let me get to 700. You now then it was 700, 750, and so on. But what it was like, the low scores, again, you go into places and no one talks to you. Well, <laughs> no one takes you seriously. When you go in and you're applying for things, but then once you get past 800, things are significantly different in how you're treated. And then we have to get 850. That's you know, that's noticeable difference when they look at it. You get the oh kind of thing. But 
for the most part, 800 and above is when you start getting reactions. You go there and you start applying for stuff and it's like, wow, gee, wow, well, okay. And then what will happen is you'll start getting lower interest rates. So you'll get a lower, for example, a mortgage rate when you're applying uh, auto loans and whatnot. But what has recently happened, and I got the 850 uh, about a little over a year-ish ago, is I went to a mall, one of the local shopping malls, just to get my phone repaired. And I started walking around at the mall. Didn't need anything other than my phone repaired at the Apple store. So just kind of walking around the mall, Sarah, and was just looking, just kind of window shopping in the different stores. Some of them I went in, some of them I just kind of looked from out in the main walk, walkway. And I said to myself and smiled, if I wanted to, I could purchase anything in this mall right now. I didn't want it. I, I don't need it at this time. But the the weight, the, I guess, embarrassment, um, the uncertainty of if I could get something, the option, that's probably the, the best word, having the option of being able to say to yourself yes or no, I can or can I get this? Not, well, I, I know I don't have you know, a good credit, so it's a definite no. Now it's, okay, now I've got the option of saying yes or no. And to me, life is about options. So getting the A50 credit score was a obviously a goal to myself, but also to let others know that it is indeed possible. I've heard and have seen and read multiple articles on how um, black community, African-American community, they're notorious for having bad credit. Well, now I'm the poster boy. Now I'm the example of no, it's not always like that. And others, whether you're African-American, black or not, you know, you can achieve a personal high score of 850, 800 above, that is possible. You just have to be disciplined about the process and say, no, it does not have to be this way. And I'm going to make a change and commit to that change. And so you're committed to this change. Are you ever concerned that your credit score is going to go back down? Yeah. And actually, if let's say the with the 850, Let's say you want to purchase or do a refinance of your property. You know, purchase a property, and I was paying an six percent interest rate on the condo that I have. Well, I've got eight fifty um, at that time when I want to refinance, so I was able to get a significantly lower. I think I'm paying two, maybe two point six percent interest rate on the, the new refi mortgage. So when that happens, your score is gonna drop, it's back up now, but yeah, it's gonna take a hit and that's just a part of the game. So, but the big thing was just achieving it and knowing that it can be done, proving to myself, showing others that yes, it can be done. And that you're not alone if you're experiencing problems with your personal finance. You're not the only one that's out there struggling, trying to make ends meet. Do we can even see the ends? But yeah, you're not the only one that's out there that uh, that's struggling, uh, again, trying to make ends meet. So that's one of the other things that I had wanted to share with your listeners, that you are not alone in this process and that it is possible. Definitely. Now, you mentioned how you started to write things down in your process because you weren't fi finding success in, you know, reading other books or listening to the CDs and stuff like that. So why did you start writing things down and what did you then do with it? OK, so after, once I first started, I did two books, the first one that I did was, we'll say, a disaster at, <laughs> at best. The first one that I wrote was a disaster per se. 
Uh, the cover art wasn't the prettiest thing. My editor had told me, Al, you know, you should change it. But I was all, you know, I was in a zone and I wanted to look a certain way. And needless to say, it was a disaster. But in that book, what I did is in the process, I made reference to various websites. Well, if you want to do X, Y, Z, you should go to www.whatever, call this phone number, do these specific steps. And what happens with the internet and phone numbers and whatnot is they change. Imagine that. I've got a website with this long URL. How dare they change the information on there? So by the time I had the book printed, much of the stuff in there, the links didn't work. Uh, the phone numbers were disconnected. And that happens a lot, especially with the credit bureaus. You've got some long URL to go to a, a certain bit of article or whatnot. And then suddenly they pull the article. How dare they pull this article? It's referenced in my book. You know? So a lot of that stuff was just obsolete. And it was just little by little, I was noticing links that were were bad and people were saying al i just bought your book and i, I saw you had a link to whatever and it's not working oh geez well that was a disaster so got a little frustrated just kind of kept it active the book available the printed book available for a while just kind of let it sit and uh this was before i got the 850 so this is we'll say maybe 795 so, so was the 800 mark so fast forward years later maybe 10 or so odd years later ish uh, a friend of mine uh, this was when i got maybe 825 or so he says al uh, so what's been happening with your credit book how's your credit score going it's like oh his credit score is going up and he says what you, you might want to consider writing a new book it's like ah oh, jesus new book you know Okay, whatever. And each of the books that I have written, the first one was about a chapter in length, about 70 some odd pages, the printed version, as well as a printed version of the current book. But the current book, the My Journey from Bad to Excellent Credit is only available in audiobook. I had it in printed version, but I pulled all that the ebook version of that. So now it's strictly audio. So it's about, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes duration. But what I did, the first book, scratch that. And then the current book, I decided to, and I was advised to, take a more narrative approach. It was like a, a biography, a autobiography kind of thing. So that is the approach that I took in the current book. There are sections in the book to where I'll talk about various situations in my life and I'll leave or I'll pause to allow the listener, in this case, the listener to soak the information in and say, so discuss it with them, with themselves or discuss it with friends and family about how they may be in a similar situation and how they can uh, fix it as well. So it's like a, a workbook, an audio workbook. So again, the printed version was about a chapter in length and Audiobook, as I'm looking now, is one hour and 15 minutes in length. So decided to take that information. I pulled all the old books, just did audiobook, and now I'm out and about sharing with others what is available. So as they're driving in their car, they're on the plane, you know, or at lunch break, they can hear my voice. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that. The information that I provide to them will help them move forward in their life, in their personal financial journey. It's great that, you know, you were able to have the success. And then part of the whole thing was like, you want to share it with others. You yeah, want yeah. other people to see that. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to kind of divert to some other topics about your life because you're more than just a credit score. Right. Um, so I'm curious to know if you could talk a little bit about being a veteran. Yeah, um, I'm a service disabled veteran and I'm an army guy. I uh, served with the 70, 702nd Main Support Battalion in Camp Casey, Korea with the you know, 2nd Infantry Division. And my last duty station was with the 166 Ordnance Company 
and Fort Hood, Texas. So I'm a, an Army officer, service disabled vet. So I'm a native Phoenician, left here after high school, went to the military junior college and was accepted into active duty after going to the officer basic course and want to get home, get away from home as quickly as possible. Being a, a preacher's kid, mother was a, uh, and a Christian evangelist, so I just want to get get away and find myself and you know put, get grow my own wings, whatever, <laughs> and uh, just want to get away as fast as possible. So, and were you able to kind of like find your own self by going into the army? Uh, actually, I found myself after leaving here for college. Now, granted, as a you know mama's boy and you know preacher's kid. That was the first time being away from home full time. I'm like, oh my lord, uh, this is what it's like, you know, living on my own. You know, in my own is what I thought. So yeah, once once I actually left home, I found myself per se, and uh, I I knew or I learned that I seemed to work better under pressure when I was going to school. Uh, the one year, one semester, I would get a little nervous and the grades would just tank. Great, the GPA was just down the tubes. And then I'd come back the second semester and, oh, well, find the light. And then suddenly they'd improve. The next semester, they would go down a bit. And then the other semester would go up. So it was like this constant roller coaster of uh, emotions. But again, I discovered that if it's if I've got a deadline, I'll hunker down and really focus. So what I try to do is I try to pack as much task upon myself to keep me focused. You know, the idle mind's the devil's workshop kind of thing, as they used to tell us. So yeah, that's that's one of the big things I learned once leaving home is that I work really good under when I'm under pressure and under deadline and the importance of time management. At the Military Junior College, New Mexico Military Institute, go, go. So um, at New Mexico Military Institute, the um, regimental commander, that's the leader of the, the Corps of Cadets, the, you know, the student Corps of Cadets, he had a, a talk with the Corps of Cadets, and a shout out to, to Ray Niblock. And in this talk, he spoke about the importance of time management. And the whole concept of time management was totally foreign to me. Like, oh, time management? So I, I, I should prioritize things? You know, totally foreign. So Ray talked about that, and I just soaked it all in. And Ray, was, Ray and I were in the same grade level, but he had been there longer and had advanced higher up in the, in the ranking. So he was talking to the, to the fellow uh, cadets. I just soaked it all in. So I just took that information and just ran with it with my life. Like, okay, well, I want to be on, start being more on time. I want to be more focused, more disciplined, blah, blah, blah. So I love that. Like, time management wasn't even like a thought. Not even before. <laughs> Not even a remote, not even a remote, a fleeting thought. A fleeting thought, so, yeah. But oddly enough, even after all that, got that little you know, discipline and the time management stuff, then you, I, I went away overseas in Korea. Then you got that issue of loneliness. Okay, you're there and thinking, oh, geez, get really lonely and sad and whatnot, far away from home. Now, granted, I had great times great times there but i was still you know far away i wanted to be far away but hey it's a different thing when you're actually far away versus you want to go far away so um yeah you just kind of had to deal with with all that and i still found myself going down this rabbit hole of bad decision making probably a lot of it had to do with loneliness and whatnot then fast forward I'm home, you're doing other stuff, and multiple marriages, multiple divorces, identity theft, and it was just this downward spiral. 
But yeah, I did find myself and it's like, okay, now I know what I like and what I don't like. And I don't like eating chili and spaghetti for three years straight for the most part. So what I had to do was uh, during more lean times, since I did not have much discretionary income, what I had to do is had to go to the store. This is when I was living in Texas, in Austin, the ghetto of Austin, Texas. What I had to do was I obviously I slept in my car for a period of time and was able to get a studio apartment, German roach infested, and just exterminated the place. Didn't have a bed. So for three years, Sarah, three years, I slept on a couch that was too small for me and rotated between sleeping on the couch and sleeping on the floor and trying to go to grad school all at the same time, a second nighttime job, and even remotely trying to have some sort of relationship. And oddly enough, I, I finished school, got my you know, graduate degree, the relationships tanked, but you know, I did finish school. I did finish school. And so would you be able to share a little bit about what it was like in Korea and how long you were there? Uh, so I was there for a year and because I was up closer to the demilitarized zone, the, the barrier, if you will, between North and South, I was only there for a year. Those that are oftentimes in the Air Force and a little further South, they can stay two years. So my, I was there for a year. The first couple of months were bad emotionally for me as a remote location. And I was hoping it would be something a little more livelier. It was just this remote location, not much to do. You really had to travel you know, an hour or so to find some decent civilization. You know, for the most part, there were these little bars and whatnot, the, the club that was on post. But again, you're on post and you get paid, you get money in your hand and you would go to the, to the bar and I'm a non-drinker, non-smoker. So you go to the bar, you're sitting there drinking your Coca-Cola and, uh, and Coke's not paying me to say that. So <laughs> drinking your Coca-Cola and then there's these things called slot machines. Wow. So you cash, you know, your hundred bucks or whatever you get. And I was just dumping money into these slot machines, hoping for the big win. Well, if I just, okay, another hundred. The next thing, you know, you just blow it through a hundred bucks or more in no time. So after that was over, you drank X number of Coca-Cola, you had your burger and fried, whatever. Play your slots, and then they shut the clubs down at, let's say, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And you spent the big majority of your money. They close the clubs down. The windows are open in the clubs. And after you leave and they lock the doors, then you see some of the employees that were working there earlier. They've changed clothes to their standard working attire, uniforms and whatnot, to more fashionable attire, playing the same slot machines that you were paying, and then all of a sudden, ding, 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 because the soldiers were just dumping money in these slot machines and they wasn't paying out much. So what they would do is after the soldiers, and they probably might even had keys to access, you know, the interior of the slot machines anyway. So you put your money in, you don't get much out as a, as a standard, standard, procedure is anyway but you know you didn't get don't get your much you didn't get your money back much of it after it was closed the workers that were there they're just winning jackpots left and right and you hear all these bells going off you're like whoa how what's happening so and it didn't take a while for that to to catch on it's like okay first thing it's like okay maybe they're lucky but then when it's happening every week like, okay, something's not right with this picture. So, yeah, so the first couple of months were really, really bad. So finally, um, I was transferred up, oddly enough, further north in a larger post, and that had more interactivity with more people. Um, and I was able to travel to Seoul, spend a lot of time with the locals. So there was more activities to do instead of just sitting around, you know, after work, sitting around in the barracks, per se, area, the office barracks area, watching TV, watching reruns, smoking, playing cards, 
ah, that was just, or go to the bar and spend all your money, you know, down rain doing other things. So I just, I needed to, to get out and find some excitement. So when I got transferred for the North larger post, I got a chance to, again, go to Seoul, spend some more time with the locals, learn the culture, imagine that. And I uh, had, a, had a good time. So those last 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, we'll say the last eight-ish months were just absolutely fabulous. Wanted to stay there another year, but the post commander said, no dice, you're going to Fort Hood, Texas. Mm. So I went to Fort Hood, Texas. So that's what it was like in Korea. And so did you end up going back home at all since you wanted to get away from home so much? Uh, so while I was there in Korea, we had what they call a mid-tour leave. So mid-tour leave, that was, uh, I think, you know, I want to say a month, you know, ballpark. I think it might have been a month. So I was able to fly home and do my mid-tour leave. And as I recall, my sister was getting married at that time. So that mid-tour leave came home, you know, the GI, the officer, you know, with some money in the bank. Oh, geez. So I just went crazy buying stuff for her wedding and just blowing money, thinking the gravy train will never end. So, um, and of course, they didn't say, no, don't spend this. Don't spend that. So I'm just spending a bunch of money, um, mid-trailly, then came back home, came, returned back to Korea for the uh, remaining period. So I did come home whenever there was some sort of vacation uh, required vacation time that was you know, required of us. Gotcha. Now, what is it that you do with your professional life nowadays? Well, I used to work for the government as a computer repair technician, break fix. So whenever people have problems with their a mouse or keyboard or whatnot, they would call me and the coworker of mine. So I've recently retired at the young age of 55 on December 30th. I turned 55, that was the goal and whatnot. So I retired the day after my birthday. I turned 55 on December 29th and I retired on December 30th. So done with that. So what I'm doing now, still focusing in on the, the personal finance, the book, the public speaking, as well as doing game publishing. So I've got a game that I've had out for a while, just kind of doing a, a makeover of it. And the game is called Lyrics Guru. And Lyrics Guru is a song lyrics trivia word game where you try to match the correct word found within the lyrics of the song. For reference, the website is www.lyrics, L-Y-R-I-C-S, Guru, G U R U dot M O B I. So lyrics guru dot M O B I. So lyrics guru, song lyrics trivia game where you try to match the correct word found within the lyrics of the song. For example, in the game, you're given a category, rock and roll, for example, and then you're given a song title, we'll say Blue Suede Shoes. Okay? And the player has to guess which one of the four words is found within the lyrics of the song. So if you're given the, the words cat, dog, run, and step, then step is the correct word. So don't step on my blues way shoes. So that is the object of the game. So we've got that out now. We've got it as an app. And we also have it as a puzzle book we have out now, as well as we're doing game shows. So what we're doing is go to various events, whether it's you know, house parties, commercial events. We do. We have got this giant game wheel that spins, kind of like the Wheel of Fortune kind of thing. So it's a game wheel that lands on a category, and the same process is, is repeated. But the other thing that we really would like to do, and I'm working diligently in trying to get this to happen, is we want to license the Lyrics Guru brand in the process of trying to get a TV and or radio game show created, the Lyrics Guru game show, for example, to rival the shows like Beat Shazam. Beat Shazam, what they've got 
is you're actually listening to audio tracks. With our game, you're not listening to any tracks, so you don't the whoever wants to finance that does not have to worry about the licensing issues of having to pay for the tracks. Oftentimes, shows like Be Shazam, uh, a music publishing company, Sony, for example, will say, all right, you can, for your show, you can use the songs, the audio tracks that we publish, and, you know, who's ever fronting all this has got to pay that. So each time a song or track is played on Beach Shazam, somebody's paying something somewhere. So with our show, is just words. Song titles, those have no copyright protection on them. And the four words are just random four words. So you've got that element that is removed and not having to pay the licensing fee. So for the tracks, and all you've got to do is just, hey, uh, pay the, uh, the licensing and work with us on the Lyris Guru brand. And we'll even create the data that is needed. We'll find all the song titles. We'll create all the categories and the list of words. We'll create all that. So Again, we just need someone that has the connections with, um, we'll say, Fox, Paramount, you know, TV, or um, Ryan Seacrest, you know, kind of thing. Those kind of folks. Uh, Dick Clark Productions. Uh, someone that is interested in having some new value-added content that could be added to a network, whether it's on TV and or radio so that's what we're doing and recently i was a casting call uh, participant for the tv show some of you may that are listening may have heard of a show called shark tank so palm spring i'm here in phoenix arizona and there was a casting call for shark tank so i took my game wheel i went to the casting call in Palm Springs, and I get there. I had all my pitch ready to go. So before you, and I didn't need any money. Because most of the time, people go on there and say, "Okay, we need fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars for X amount of equity in your product and or service." So I didn't need any money. Fortunately, what I wanted to do was I wanted to secure a licensing deal, specifically with the is a person that's one of the investors is uh, he goes by mr wonderful so i had wanted to strike a licensing deal for the lyrics guru brand with mr wonderful so i get there didn't want any money so i'm thinking okay i just go there and just pitch a licensing deal so as i'm going in there about five minutes or so before it was my time the staff says, okay, before you go in, uh, you have to ask for money. What? My, I, 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 don't, I don't need money. So he says, well, hey, if you want to go in, you've got to ask for money. Like, oh, geez. Okay. So, you know, then you just got to pull some numbers, you know, out of the air. Okay. So first it was, you know, $5,000. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try to pitch some investors. Please invest five thousand you know you can sell your car you know you can sell some stuff on ebay and get five thousand dollars so i thought okay so let me scratch that out so then i thought okay and this is all in a span of five minutes or less like okay well five thousand dollars that's uh can't do that so i thought okay let me just add another zero so i thought okay fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand now really these are you know millionaires and and you got a billionaire in there. So you're going to really go walk in there and ask him for $50,000. Really? <sighs> okay, well, so let me just add another zero. So I, I went in, I pitched $500,000 know, and asking for the funds for advertising. I didn't, I didn't need it, but that's what I pitched to the cast and call staff. Because what you do is you go in there and you pitch to the first set of gatekeepers, the first set of gatekeepers like your idea, then you move forward with, as I recall, going on TV. So I wasn't technically on TV, but I did at least pitch it to the first set of gatekeepers. First set of gatekeepers said, well, hey, you know, if we like you, 
We'll contact you. We'll call you. We'll email you. Well, they didn't hear me. They didn't call me back. They didn't email me either. But the good thing was I was able to meet some very interesting people. If you've been on social media, especially Facebook, for example, you may have seen a product called um, Butter Cloth, B-U-T-T-E-R, Butter Cloth. It's a line of men's shirts that are real company, and they're not paying me to say this, Butter Cloth shirts, brand of shirts, the men's shirts. So as I was standing in this insanely long line to make my pitch, I'm standing there and the group with Butter Cloth men's shirts, which is doing fabulous now, uh, they were a group ahead of me. So we just kind of chatted back and forth. Hey, you know, what are you, what are you guys here for? You know, blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. So next thing you know, that um, you know, we're about to go in maybe a few minutes. In a few minutes or so, they said, well, we're just waiting for our our, uh, our go-to guy, something like that. So they said, so who are you waiting for? They said, well, uh, Meta World Peace. I thought, you know, Ron, I think it goes by Ron Artest, but they went by Meta World Peace. So paid with the Lakers. So I said, really? So seconds later, he comes from, you know, around the, the wall and whatnot. So I get a chance to meet with him, took a picture with him. But they went in before me, and we were all kind of talking back and forth about each of our products. So they went in. They were able to get past the first gatekeeper. They were able to get on TV. Meta was on TV with the guy from uh, the Buttercloth, the designer and whatnot. So they made a smoking deal with the uh, – with the investors, but it was nice to see that, hey, at least I was able to pitch my idea and get just a wee close, you know, to fame and fortune with meeting a celebrity and, again, being able to pitch my product. So I learned uh, a lesson with in that regard and, uh, again, move forward. And from there, I was able to uh, continue on with the Lyris Guru game, adding a variety of additional products and services from that point forward and even changed the wheel the initial wheel the gang wheel that we use was very bland at best so i was able to come around and put some more creative illustrations card kind of cartoonish image imagery on there changed the face plate modified the logo a bit and i, I believe it's much more presentable than the bland at best wheel look that we had before so the wheel again looked like a, a wheel of fortune but it was just bland the text was bland the face plate just was bland so now it looks more lively and seems to get a good response from the masses when we play you know in person whether it's at senior citizens homes or uh, neighborhood association events and corporate events as well. Hey, and it's so good to hear like how, you know, your passion for this project, that you're trying different things, you're diversifying it and, you know, you like you go big or go home. Like why not? Yeah. If you're passionate about something and people are enjoying it. I got one for you. Go big or go bigger. No, so you never can go home. Go big. I can't recall. There's a guy on uh Facebook, uh, Facebook, can't recall what the guy's name is, some, you know, an investor or whatnot. So he said, go big or go bigger. So I, that's not my original one, but I took it from somebody else. I think it's Grant. The guy's name's Grant something. But anyway, go big or go bigger. That's great. Is there anything else that you would like to share with my listeners before I start to wrap things up? One of the other things that I'm doing is I've got a program out now called Dear Father Al, and it's available on Facebook. Originally broadcast, the original broadcast is on Facebook, and we do the rebroadcast on YouTube, and additional links to each of those are available on Instagram and uh, Twitter. So Dear Father Al is broadcast every Saturday from 2 o'clock p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And on Dear Father Al, so D-E-A-R, Father, F-A-T-H-E-R-A-L. So Dear Father Al is the handle for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And in Dear Father Al, I am an advice columnist. I had a previous show that I was doing for two years, but switched up the name. So 
The new name of the show is Dear Father Al. So what I do is I'm in priestly attire. So I might be dating myself. So if you're familiar with a character called Father Guido Sarducci from Saturday Night Live, an old Saturday Night Live is around, but I don't think they used the dear of the Father Guido Sarducci character. So I was dressed up as a priest. Okay. And I've got a black, black, you know, attire, the black jacket, uh, suit coat, the you know, the collar, black, and I've got a, a black gaucho style hat with the with the string around your neck and you know the glasses and whatnot. And I'm holding a cigar. Father Guido's on Saturday Night Live are using a cigarette, but I thought I'd use a big stogie in my presentation. So what Father Al does, similar to like the whole Dear Abby thing, is Father Al takes daily problems and then provides a common sense solution. So people will email me their problems, they'll call me, they'll text me and say, Dear Father Al, you know, this problem's happened, this problem's happening, I need to settle an argument. Stuff like that. So send it to me on the show. I'll read out their problem and then provide a common sense solution. So I've been doing that. The new show, Dear Father Al, will debut on Saturday, August 27th at 2 o'clock p.m. all the way to 2.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Facebook Live. Right. And I can make sure to leave that link in the description along with other links here at the end. Now at the end of all my episodes, I do ask all of my guests a random question that doesn't Ooh. have to do with anything we're we've talked about. My question is, is what do you procrastinate most nowadays? I procrastinate most with, now that I'm retired, you know, I can just lay around. So, but for the most part, I procrastinate in getting up. Although I'm I'm hungry, obviously hungry in the morning time, but just now that I'm retired, I could just, you know, sleep a little longer. It's like, okay, you know, I'm wide awake, but, you know, I'm going to sleep in 5, 10, 15 minutes more. So that's one of the things that I really procrastinate with is getting up out of bed and cooking me something to eat. I might even just lay in bed, just stomach growling. Okay, get up. So that's that's what I procrastinate on. A lot. All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I just mentioned, I'll be leaving the Dear Father Al Facebook website in the description for Al. I'll also leave the website that he shared earlier for Lyrics Guru. And I'll be leaving a link if you want to go check out his latest book as the audio book. Uh, so feel free to check all of those links out. They'll be in the description of this episode, along with on my website, along with all of the other past episodes and all of the past episode links. They are all cataloged there for you to check out. If you'd like to connect with the podcast here, our website is in the description that brings you to all of that stuff. And it also brings you to all of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you would like to support the podcast, a link to do that is in the description as well. So always appreciate donations monetarily. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, you can email me. My email is in the description as well. I love hearing from new people and new stories. So thank you so much, Al, for spending time with me today. And to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity for having me on your show. And if by chance, if you are listening you're interested in having me as a guest on your podcast or in person, reach out to me via podmatch.com. You should be able to find me, Al Jones, and my profile, profile and how to contact me. Again, thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity. Mm-hmm.